So I picked up another old game recently, and uh, this was based on the fact that I, uh, over this past weekend, uh, my friend uh, who lives nearby ran a local um, mini-con where we have about seven or eight of us um, spend four days playing all sorts of different games. Um, this year we played the, our, our big game. Usually have, we have one big game that takes everyone all day to play, and then we break it up with lighter fare. Over the remaining three days of the con, uh, our big game this year was Twilight Imperium. Um, but one of the uh, games that we played, that a, a group of us played on Friday, um, was Britannia. And the version that we actually played was the Fantasy Flight um, reprint of it from, oh, I don't know, probably 2008 or something like that. Um, I think it was about 10 years ago that they reprinted it. Um, and uh, it, while it was fun, I actually didn't like the artwork all that much on it. Um, the counters were actually kind of difficult to tell apart. Uh, so, like, I, I wanted to get a copy of the game um, to add to my collection, but I didn't want uh, to get the Fantasy Flight version. So, I kind of looked around to see um, what the old Avalon Hill version looked like. And I've never, I've never actually played the old Avalon Hill version, but I have played games um, that, were, that were part of this series, this, uh, this style of game, um, which is kind of the where you're following. Um, a particular region or country through different epics of its history or different eras of its history. And uh, each person is controlling multiple different um, either tribes or uh, cultures or civilizations or whatever you want to look at it as, um, or groups of people uh, that occur through the different eras of the history of a particular country. So with Britannia, you know, you start, um, and I forget when the era actually starts, I'm not sure if it says here or not, uh, 43 AD, yeah, so 43 AD up through, so through Roman Britain up through uh, William the Conqueror in 1066, so, uh, you know, almost 600 years of, actually more than that, it starts in 43 AD, more like a thousand years of British history. Um, so I hadn't played this, but I had played uh, the old Avalon Hill game Maharaja, which um, has uh, is essentially Britannia, but set in India. Um, there's also the, the first game I ever played in this, of this type of game was History of the World, which was uh, probably around 94 or 95. Um, this would be the Avalon Hill version of it and the old kind of blue-gray colored box uh, that didn't have all the plastic minis and stuff that the more recent printings have. Um, so I was familiar with this type of game and really enjoyed it um, just because I love games that, that pay attention to that level of history where you're not just, oh, you're, yeah, you're, it's like, you know, like Risk or something where, oh, you're just the blue player, you know, you don't have, there's no, it's not really tied to any history, you're just some sort of faction. Uh, historical faction. It, Conquest of the Empire was kind of like that. The old uh, Milton Bradley um, Game Master series on uh, ancient Rome where you were playing sort of geograph loosely geographically based historical sides, but they weren't named anything, you know, so it was kind of like this generic history. Um, and, and I like the specificity of the history in, in Britannia, in Maharaja, in History of the World. Uh, there's a couple other games in this genre, and I, I can't remember what they are. I want to say Machiavelli is kind of like this, um, except it's not. Uh, there, I think there's more chrome elements to Machiavelli. Um, it's not quite as simplistic of a, of a rule set. It's a it's a different version, but I think that same type of game where you're going where you're going through several eras of of history. But um, I could be wrong there because I never actually played Machiavelli, so. Anyway, uh, I, I, I didn't want the Fantasy Flight version, but I did want a copy of the game um, just because I enjoyed it. And because I have Maharaja from Avalon Hill, and my, it's part of my Avalon Hill collection, I thought, well, it'd be kind of cool to get a copy of the old Avalon Hill version of the game. So I was able to... Uh, I, I, this one I think I got from eBay. So I just had stumbled across this on eBay. There was an unpunched copy 
on eBay that I think had bid up to, you know, like 14 or 15 bucks or something. And so I uh, put a max bid in, I think of 30 bucks and ended up getting it for 21. So I thought it was a pretty good deal for an unpunched copy of a, of a classic Avalon Hill title. Um, it does have the, this uh, ages five and up sticker stuck on it, um, which, you know, somebody's tried to peel off and failed. Uh, I bought a game that had that same sticker on it. And this was a copy of Titan. Um, had that same sticker on it, and I just took a hairdryer to it and melted it off, and it, you know, every, it came right off and all the glue and everything just wipes away. Um, the, the only drawback is, is that where the sticker was, obviously you've got this discoloration in the perfect shape of the sticker. Um, there was no damage to the box, but you know, the, the box front, the exposed box front has faded over the years and the part that was covered by the sticker um, did not, or whether the glue may have discolored it or whatever, but um, you know, it was, it was nice to get the sticker off of there even with the discoloration that it left behind. Um, as long as there was no damage, I don't mind the discoloration. The sticker is much more onerous um, than the, the mild discoloration. So the same, I'll use the same technique here um, and peel this off. And it looks like, yeah, there's some more gunk up here where a, a price tag was probably stuck at one point. Again, you can use a, a hair dryer um, just to melt the, it'll melt the glue and then the, the whole thing will just wipe off. Um, so that'll be a little box restoration, but aside from the stickers that were on it, the, the box is actually in very, very good shape. There's really not, you know, this is like mild shelf wear. You can see here on the back where somebody taped it, which I think is kind of funny. Um, and this tape looks like it, almost like it has been professionally removed. Like there's no residue behind. It's really just discoloration. There's a little residue along the edges there. Um, so same thing, if there's any gunk left, you can always get that kind of stuff off. Um, the weird thing is, is that there's really no discoloration on the side of the box where the tape might have been affixed. But anyway, I just thought it was funny that somebody taped the box, although the contents are unpunched and, as you'll see, are like in perfect condition. So somebody felt the need to tape the box closed even though the con there was no danger of any content spilling out simply because the game is unpunched um, and they never played it, you know. So it's like you'd think, oh, well, you might tape it if you're moving it around or carrying it somewhere or you're bringing it over to a friend's house or something all the time. You know, tape it so stuff doesn't fall out. I mean, I would never tape my boxes now, but, you know, when I was a kid, hell, why not? I don't care about that stuff. Uh, so it, was just, it just seemed weird to me that, that it would be taped. But, Otherwise, like the box is in really, really good shape, um, which I always like. I like boxes in really good shape, although I've repaired, repaired many a box in my time, and it usually, you know, I don't only buy perfect games. Um, the unboxing that I did right before this of Pax Britannica being an exception where I actually went out and bought another copy of a game just because I wanted a nicer, a nicer copy of it than the one that I had. So. This one, I just found a really nice copy for dirt cheap, so I'll take it. Um, looking inside the box, I've got some dice floating around in here. And I'm not familiar with these as Avalon Hill dice. Um, I don't remember. They are nicer than the old SPI dice, though. But I'm sure they still roll crazy all over the place. So this is what caught my eye. I mean, this is these are the the cards for all the different um, culture cultures that you're going to be running in the game and totally unpunched I and mean, these things are just crisp <laughs> is a good way to describe them so you can see just a giant sheet of these cards um, that you'll want to punch out and these are perforated and there's not a good way um, to punch these out without leaving all the little perforation nubs on it. I'm not sure if I want to just take a pair of scissors and just cut along the perforation and do it that way, um, just to have as neat an edge on the cards as possible. Um, yeah, this is a, a nice unpunched collector's copy, uh, but I will intend to play it and punch it out as I do with all my games. 
The only thing I haven't um, punched out and played is my copy of Magic Realm, which I haven't been able to bring myself to, to punch out for some reason. Uh, the same dilemma I had on my unboxing video from that from like four or five years ago. Uh, so I've got all these cards to punch out. I'll have to figure out some way to do it so they look fairly neat. There's the rule book and also seemingly unused. Um, something I pointed out on the Pax Botanica video, always look at your staples on these and you can tell what sort of moisture environment um, they were stored in. These are nice, perfect silvery staples. Um, and the rules are I mean, very clean, very nice. This, you know, definitely never used, uh, no stains or even any sign of wear or that anybody would even really ever page through these, you know, no creases here where your fingers would be, so it's a really nice copy of the rules here. And it looks like this was, I think this was 87 or thereabouts. Um, let's see, date on the front, yeah, it's in the copyright on the back, 87. Um, so they were starting to get more color in here, it looks like maybe three colors. We've got red, black, and white, um, and gray. So, and not very long rules for this either. It's a fairly simple game. Um, there's just usually some some chrome uh, bits or some fiddly rules surrounding um, how some of the different cultures interact, or particular leaders that that some cultures may have. You get into uh, later in the game where you start crowning kings um, and that gives you points and things like that. Uh, so there's there's just little little bits like that. I mean you can see here it's eight pages of rules. I mean it's just it's simple, you know, fairly fairly text heavy on those eight pages, but still just eight pages. Um, and then you've got the Q and A section and then several pages, about two pages of historical notes and a chronology. Add for the general there, which I think has had several articles on uh, um, Britannia over the years. And here's a victory point record track. It is keeping track of your victory points um, from era to era is definitely one of the more procedure heavy things. You want to keep track of those, and it's not the easiest thing to do. So these counters, um, I mean, they're just like gorgeous, perfect unpunched counter sheets and the matte finish, which is awesome. I mean, by 87, you know, we were past the SPI era of matte finish counters. And my recollection is that most even uh, Avalon Hill games of the era had um, glossy counters. So this is kind of cool to get to get uh, matte finish counters. Um, unfortunately, these aren't necessarily easier to read. I mean, this this printing on here, it shows up pre pretty clearly on the camera, um, but just looking at it with my eyes, <laughs> um, this detail is kind of hard to make out. So fortunately, it actually says what each of the factions are, and that was the big problem with the, with the uh, FFG version, was they used these symbols um, that all looked pretty similar, and then all of the, and, you know, had a picture of the different tribal guys, you know, they had artwork of the different factions that all, the, which also all looked pretty similar. I mean, a lot of them were just long-haired guys with axes and tattoos and, you know, bare chests or, you know, rudimentary armor of some kind. So very difficult to tell, uh, tell apart um, a lot of the different faction counters, which I found kind of frustrating. So here, you know, like, like the FFG game, these are still all split into colors. You'll have um, the different colors for each player, um, and then each color will have different tribes um, that each player is tracking. So here, for the red player, um, they're going to have the, the Brigantes, I guess. Um, I'm not sure how you pronounce the E at the end of that. The Irish, the Saxons, um, the Norsemen. And so, and then the green player, you can see, has the Welsh, the Caledonians, the Danes, the um, your purple player has the Romans, the Scots, and then you've got the Roman British that show up later. That's when King Arthur uh, shows up. The Scots, the Norwegians, the Dubliners, 
And then uh, for the blue player, you've got the Bill Guy, the Picts, the Angles, the Normans. Um, who will have Norman Cap? That'll be William the Conqueror showing up then. So it's just it's nice to have have the names actually on the counters. Um, so I, I prefer that to the to the symbols uh, used by the FFG version. Um, and then you've got some other stuff. You got your leader counters and then uh, forts, marking units as as uh, being leaders. So very very nice counters. Only single sided. Um, there's no flipping counters needed in the game so that's that's very nice to have uh, some unpunched counters and then you can see the old nail in uh, reply cards it's always funny to see these oh if you have any questions write write the company not anymore and so here's it's a mounted board because naturally it's a uh, it's an avalon hill title they were all mounted it's one of the things that, that spoiled people into thinking why don't all war games have mounted boards. Well, War Games did not traditionally have mounted boards. That just was an Avalon Hill thing because it was owned. Because Avalon Hill was owned by a printing company, they could get discounts on mounted boards, and so they just made all of their games have mounted boards. Um, that's a contrivance that people just assume, hey, I'm paying for a game, a tabletop game. Why isn't the board mounted? My Monopoly board's mounted. I can't play on paper maps. Uh, when in reality, that's you know that's what war games are. The the board games are the exception. Do the mounted boards are the exception? So here is the map. Um, functional. Uh, it's not you know particularly splashy, but it gets the job done. The FFG one was actually not a whole lot more um, sophisticated than this uh, in terms of artwork. Um, <laughs> weirdly enough. This board seems like much nicer quality, uh, and you know it's got this nice finish on it. Um, it actually seems like much nicer quality than the uh, than the Fantasy Flight board, which um, was a t had a tendency. It seemed weak. Like if I back folded it, like it would just bust. Um, so I, you know to, to to get it to lay flat. So this uh, is is very good quality, and it's actually it's interesting. It's got this red finish on the back of it, which most of the Avalon Hill games that I'm familiar with have the brown the brown uh, map on it, but there is a copy of the map. It's got um, your turn record chart um, along the sides here that explains what units are coming in for what um, cultures per uh, per era. Um, and then up here is your turn order in which the order of the different uh, factions uh, goes. This is where you're actually tracking, you know, you'll be actually tracking the turns, but you'll be reading the charts on the side here to see um, when people come in. Um, and then this is your population. I believe this is where, uh, the number's a little different on here, but this is where you can carry over um, your population points. Because uh, every era, your, your counters, you know, depending on the number of spaces that you're occupying, um, your counters are going to, to multiply, and that's how you get your reinforcements and add more units. Um, so anytime you go over on the number of points that you're spending for your population, you track it on there. So uh, anyway, there's the the map, very nice and functional. Actually, it's funny. Um, the Fantasy Flight version had, you know, rough terrain was just rough. It all looked the same, uh, whereas here... And so Lindsay looked like it was mountains, but when I was looking at the map, I, I thought, you know, I'm pretty sure, like, this this, this Norfolk um, coast along here isn't mountains. My recollection is that this is all, like, salt marshes along here. So uh, <laughs> they've showed it properly on here, whereas on the, on the uh, FFG map, it just looked like generic mountains. Like, somehow there were mountains right here in this little corner of England, which as far as I knew was, you know, just farmland and, and marshland. So, uh, just interesting. Um, everything else on the map is mountains. That's the only place that they show, show marshes on there. Apparently there's some variant of the map also that has a, a, a playable Ireland, um, that also has some areas of control in it. Uh, I don't know what version of the release that was, or if it was some special board that you had to buy directly from Avalon Hill. I don't know how that worked, or if it was something people printed out, but I've seen it, I've seen pictures of it on Board Game Geek, so 
I don't know if it was a, a general magazine thing um, that came along later. Don't know. Um, I'm fine not playing Ireland. We didn't play it in the FFG version, so it apparently wasn't something that was carried over uh, to that version of the game. Anyway, it was uh, a great find. Um, I always love, sometimes on eBay, a lot of stuff can be overpriced, but in this case, uh, I was able to find a really, actually a really good deal on a really, really nice um, mint copy of Britannia uh, for 20 bucks. So, a kind of a lucky deal there. Uh, I have a little work to do on the, on the box to get the labels and the gunk off, uh, but otherwise, uh, this will be a nice shelf edition, and uh, I think I'll enjoy playing this one more um, with the simpler older uh, counter artwork on it. So anyway, thanks for watching.